Welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research with our colleagues from the OECD, where we'll be presenting the new economic survey of the UK that was published this morning. Um, the OECD and the National Institute of Economic Research have cooperated for an incredibly long time. And one of the highlights of our calendar is to welcome the OECD team into London and to talk about prospects for the global economy and, and the UK. And we're delighted in a way at this very difficult time to be able to combine forces and talk about some of the prospects in the UK on the result on the back of what is really an enormously impressive document in terms of looking at the fundamental issues that the UK is facing. And I'm very pleased that you've been able to join us this afternoon. And as you can see, the sun is shining in uh, Smith Square behind my shoulder. But uh, in reality, it's a rather dull grey day in Britain today. And I think if I'm not stepping, overstepping the mark, and I speak only on behalf of the Institute, that seems to me to be reflective of the mood wi more widely in the country. So in a serious vein, we hope the discussion that we have today will allow you all to think a little bit more deeply about the very serious problems the country is uh, facing over the next few months, but also I think the survey makes very clear over the next few years. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce the team today um, from the OECD. Sebastian Barnes is um, head of division at the OECD, um, was previously a councillor uh, to the chief economist and has a number of roles at the OECD and uh, was lucky enough to start his career at the Bank of England. Um, he will then, uh, we also have John uh, Paralusian, who's the head of the UK and Netherlands desk at the OECD and has worked at a number of desks at the OECD um, and he's originally from the uh, Norwegian Ministry of Finance. Um, always delighted to chat uh, with Jon. Um, Tim Bullman is joining us as an economist in the OECD's economics department, um, very much looking at policy priorities in the European countries and with a speciality in labour markets. Um, uh, before going to the OECD, he worked at the World Bank uh, as a country economist on a number of countries. So he's bringing a wealth of IFI experience to the issues when he's thinking of the UK. Um, he started work at the Reserve Bank uh, of Australia. So always, always glad to talk to Tim. And, and Annabel Moine is a deputy head of division at the OECD. Uh, before going to the OECD, she worked in ANSI, the French Statistical Office uh, and the ECB. Uh, and has also uh, worked at the Fresh French Fiscal Council and the Court of Auditing. And I have to say, if I don't want to embarrass her personally, the conversations we've had have been very rewarding as we've tried to understand what have been some very complex and difficult moments in the life of this economy, but also in, in the world. So um, the way we're structuring the thing is that um, Sebastian, followed by Jean, uh, Tim and Annabelle will talk through the OECD uh, survey. And I'm delighted this afternoon to then be able to turn to Dr. Handa Kachuk, who is the Institute's uh, head of macroeconomics, the Institute, one of the Institute's two deputy directors, who joined us last month uh, from a post as deputy director of the Central Bank of Turkey. So it, uh, it's a chance to, for me to formally welcome her to the Institute in this role. Uh, delighted to have you over. I won't go through the uh, issues with uh, the Home Office, but we've solved them. Very delighted to have you here. And you'll be um, responding um, to the key questions to do with COVID and Brexit uh, for a few minutes in reply. And I'll try to sum up by talking a little bit about the longer term productivity questions. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, welcome all, welcome speakers. Um, Sebastian, if I may, and I'll turn off my camera uh, during this process uh, of the presentation. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jack, for that uh, excellent introduction. Uh, the NISA is obviously, as you said, has a long relationship with the OECD. It's, a, it's an institution we, we rely on in many ways at the OECD. Uh, and so it's fantastic to be able to share our thinking on the UK with you and your, uh, your stakeholders this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to say a few introductory remarks before, we, before handing over to my, my colleagues who actually did the hard work of, um, of writing uh, the report. Let me just give you one or two words of introduction on the OECD economic surveys. I'm sure you're familiar with these for the UK and for other countries. They come out roughly every, every two years. I think the peculiarity of the surveys is that this is actually a peer reviewed document. This is a document that goes before a committee of the OECD's member countries of its key partners, uh, and they bring on their experience, their wisdom, they bring on uh, what they know has worked in their countries uh, to this process. And I think it's something that makes this process a very rich uh, and powerful one. Of course, it draws on the OECD's analysis and cross-country data as well. A lot of what we're doing is really benchmarking in some sense the UK economy uh, to other countries and that guides us in what we're doing. 
The objective of the survey is ultimately to make policy recommendations to government, to recommend policies that based on where the UK stands relative to other countries, what we see as being the main priorities. Of course, this is a time where the policy agenda is very, very busy. And so we're also trying to really select the things that we think matter the most, where policy should really be, be thinking hard. Um, and the way, and I think a final point on the surveys is that at least when I first joined the OECD 15 years ago, we were very much in a sort of supply side, maximizing GDP kind of a world. Now the surveys are fully mainstreamed. Uh, the idea of, of trying to maximize well or increase well-being. Uh, we, we of course still look at growth. We still look at productivity. We still care about fiscal sustainability, but also we take a broader look. We also look at inequality quality of opportunity, education, the environment, and a whole range of other issues. And we try to have policies that are holistic in the sense they, they make sense from those multiple perspectives, and also that they, they hit these, these multiple um, objectives. So that's a few words on the surveys. Happy to discuss uh, that uh, at the end of the presentation, if you wish. Let me now turn to the main messages of the UK survey for this year. So the UK essentially faces three challenges. The challenge of COVID-19, uh, which has had a, a huge impact on the economy, which of course the dominant uh, driving force in the world economy today. Second, the impact of leaving the EU single market uh, and customs union at the end of this year. And third, a longer standing challenge, which is essentially related to low productivity growth, but has uh, many facets. So there are really three issues uh, that we think the UK has to address, which make for a very challenging policy environment. In terms of our main recommendations, there are really three areas that the survey focuses in on. Of course, there are more detailed recommendations in specific areas. The first is that it's crucial that fiscal and monetary support continue to to create the conditions to foster a sustainable recovery. We've obviously seen a lot of policy action, both fiscal and uh, monetary. We'll be coming onto that in a little bit more detail in a moment, but an, a very strong priority in our view is to increase both public and private investment. In terms of the parts that are more amenable to policy, we think that it's important that digital infrastructure uh, be prioritized in public investment packages, and also that the public investment packages, the stimulus that may be provided in the months ahead should help to accelerate the green transition. So this is a good example of different policies working together to achieve multiple objectives. The second area of recommendation is that it's crucial to get people back to good quality jobs and to support low income households in the UK. Uh, a number of policies to contribute to these, but where we think the greatest uh, effort in terms of policy is required is firstly to increase job support uh, search, increased training. These are areas where the UK is traditionally uh, lags behind the best performing countries, and this is where more support is required. Secondly, uh, to make childcare more accessible by reducing out-of-pocket costs. And the third and final area is to ensure a close, close trading relationship with the European Union uh, and other countries. It's obviously critical that a um, hard Brexit is avoided, but even beyond that, it's impossible, it's very important to keep low trade barriers to trade investment both with the EU and with non-EU countries. And in particular, a priority for the UK should be to seek high market access for services. Those are our key messages. I'm now gonna, now gonna hand over to my colleagues to explain the reasoning for this and to give you a little bit more detail. Jan. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, thanks all for listening in. You all felt it, locked inside your homes, working, socializing through the screen and with a wide range of your normal consumption just off limits. So the GDP shock from COVID-19 is unprecedented in modern times, as you see from this figure. Sectors are hit unevenly, and most hit sectors such as transport and tourism will not rebound to pre-COVID levels over our forecast horizon. Leaving the single market will be a shock to trade from January, free trade agreement or not. Brexit has held back growth in the past few years and will continue to do so also going forward. Against this background, we see GDP contracting by 10% this year. We see a strong pickup following the end of the lockdown, but easing off into next year. But it could have been much worse. The policy reaction in terms of economic supports 
has been timely and appropriately massive. On the monetary policy side, rates were cut and asset purchases increased. On the fiscal side, you had multiple supports, notably emergency funding to businesses, wage support in the job retention scheme, and funding of the health response. Fiscal support has to continue. Of course, at some point, you will have to address the structural deficits, but uh, only when the recovery is firmly established, as we recommend in the survey. And a large share of the fiscal support was targeted at labor. So I think this is a good time to leave the screen to my colleague, Tim, who will tell you more about that. Oh, thanks, Jorn, and thanks to the organizers uh, of this event. Uh, so if we go to the first slide, uh, thank you. Uh, what we see here, so this uh, graph has not yet been updated for the labor force data released yesterday, but we see there's been a large increase in, um, in unemployment. Uh, but what's striking is perhaps given the size of the shock that it's been limited to this level. And that reflects the effectiveness of the, um, of the government's policy responses up to this point of the uh, job retention scheme in particular. It's now being phased out. It's gonna close by the end of October and it's gonna be succeeded by a new job support scheme. Uh, at the outset, this scheme was designed to be narrower and to provide less of um, pre-crisis wages than the pre-existing um, job, job retention scheme. And in a way as well to be, um, to, to make firms decide whether or not they think the drop in activity is going to be enduring when they decide whether or not they're going to access this scheme. And this is um, similar to, to other schemes which other countries are now moving towards. Uh, What's a new innovation just in the last couple of weeks is that the is that this new scheme will also include an element, an arm which will support uh, workers in firms which are again being forced to shut down because of new COVID restrictions. These schemes are important because, as you can see here, they've been limiting so far the increase in unemployment um, and ensuring that workers remain attached to the labour market through this shock. This is important for those workers, both short term and their long term prospects. Uh, we argue that to slow the rise in unemployment and to sure, ensure that those who do lose work can quickly move back to employment, it's going to be really important to ensure that there are incentives for hiring. What's also important, if we go to the next graph, is to ensure that these workers have the skills that employers need. So this graph, in a way, it's a little bit backward looking. It's showing you the change in demand for different types of skills over recent years. And what comes through really strongly here is that the... Um, demand for employers where that's been growing most has been in basic skills. So those three blue bars just on the, the left-hand half of the graph, where you can see um, the largest increase in demand for basic reading, understanding, report analysis, numerical skills, et cetera. Uh, the challenge in the UK is at the one hand, there's this increasing demand for just basic skills. And then if we go to the next chart, there's decreasing participation in lifelong and vocational education. This graph is showing you the, um, the share of adults who are participating in lifelong learning. In the UK, it's a little bit above the average of European countries, but it's slipping. Uh, and there aren't too many other countries where this ratio has been slipping. We can show you many other metrics of this. Um, Annabelle will show you another one as well. Um, and in fact, across the survey, this question of skills and training um, is a cross-country recurring theme. When we look at the impact to the response to the COVID response, when we look at um, some of the factors uh, behind uh, improving the UK's long-term productivity performance. So we emphasize uh, the need to increase, already the government in its latest packages is increasing the resources which are allocated to active labor market programs and particularly to training, to access to apprenticeships. And these are steps in the right direction, but as you can see here, more is going to be needed to reverse the trend of recent years. We particularly emphasize the need to improve digital skills of low skilled workers. If we think of the sectors which are likely to have the greatest prospects as we come out of this crisis, they're going to be sectors and, and jobs which require stronger digital skills. Uh, and, the, uh, and this underscores the, the need to increase public spending on training. If we go to the next graph, we can see the other reason why these COVID developments are so concerning is 
you know, you think of what's happened in the UK over recent years, and there's been important progress in reducing the risk of poverty. This is one indicator of poverty, which is the severe material deprivation rate. And it looks at, um, it asks households, what can they actually afford? Can they afford to go on holiday? Can they afford, do they have some emergency cash and so forth? And the households which are least likely to have these are people who are out of work. Uh, the, a lot of the discussion in the UK has been about the issue of in-work poverty. And you can see the um, in-work poverty rates are more modest than those for people who are out of work. In the survey, we emphasise the role of uh, well-designed in-work benefit schemes to support low-income workers who are in work. Um, and shortly, the Low Pay Commission is going to be releasing uh, its recommendations for the next adjustment in the national living wage as the government tries to move towards um, increasing the national living wage to 66% of the median wage by 2024 and reducing the age eligibility for the national living wage from 25 to 21. Given the nature of the COVID shocks, uh, which are particularly affecting uh, more vulnerable workers in sectors where a larger share of workers earn the uh, minimum wage. Uh, as we discussed in the survey, this, uh, and as the existing institutional mechanisms allow, this underscores the need to assess whether or not this uh, timetable is appropriate, uh, given the nature of the shocks that we're experiencing. Uh, and at the same time, perhaps a more effective means to reduce the risk of in-work poverty is to develop the role of in-work benefits. Now, if we go to the next slide, the other point, another area where COVID has had a big impact in the UK, as it has all around the world, is on carers. Uh, more time in telework, closure of schools, closure of primary schools, cancellation of other events, um, the caring burdens have increased everywhere. And in the UK, like in virtually every country, these burdens disproportionately fall on women. Uh, the impact of this in the UK, so access to childcare is widespread. Uh, but the number of hours that people spend in childcare, that children spend in childcare are relatively short, which is what this graph is showing, is the number of hours per week that a child actually spends in childcare. And this correlates as well with women's labour force participation. So employment rates are high for women, but an unusually large share work only part-time. This, this can hold back careers, and it contributes to the sizable pay gap in the UK between men and women. This partly reflects the nature of uh, public support for access to childcare where households can access uh, 15 or 30 hours of free childcare, depending on the children's ages and the household's um, um, situation. What we recommend in the survey um, to uh, increase access to full-time childcare is to, um, is to use a model where support is provided relative to, uh, to the household's income. So there's some sort of subsidy that's proportionate to the um, household's income, regardless of the number of hours of childcare that's used. And this would follow the example, Norway recently introduced some reforms that, uh, um, that, that follow this path. And it can improve access to childcare in a way that's going to be equitable across the, um, the income distribution and not lead to effectively very high tax rates when uh, the carer starts increasing hours beyond part-time work. Uh, so they're the points I'd like to make. We move on. Thank you, Tim, and um, thank you for to the uh, to NISER to uh, to give us this opportunity to to present our our work. Um, so I'm going to present um, the work we've done on productivity and then on um, the uh, uh, on leaving the EU single market. Uh, so the survey makes a, a deep dive into the issue of productivity in the service sector in the UK. Uh, you all know it's a long-standing issue. The UK has been suffering from weak productivity uh, for some time now, but with uh, COVID, um, the issue is becoming even more pressing because we know that the best and the strength of the recovery is going to depend to a large extent to what's going to happen um, in the service sector. And in particular, um, 
productivity in the service sector will have to markedly increase for um, the recovery to be long-standing. And so the survey identifies some policy issues to, um, to achieve this ambition. So what we, uh, okay. No. Uh, so what we um, we show in this graph is uh, basically a comparison between the different business cycles in terms of level of productivity. And you can see uh, the red line is a current cycle. So you can see that in the past, productivity has been recovery, uh, recovering at a relatively fast pace, but this time around was different and productivity has been um, almost flatlining. If we look across countries now, we also find that the productivity slowdown has been larger in the UK than in most of the city countries. And in this chart here, what we have represented is what we call the productivity shortfall, which is uh, the difference between the actual level of productivity and the level productivity would have achieved as productivity continued to grow at pre-financial um, financial crisis rate. So you can see that almost all the countries have experienced a productivity shortfall. But on average, across OECD countries, and this is the green bar here, uh, this productivity shortfall was about 10%, while in the UK, it's almost 20%. So what we did next was to break down this productivity shortfall into the contribution of the different uh, sectors. And you can see in the chart how the UK compares with the average OECD countries. And in particular, you can see that the main difference is that the service sectors um, accounts for the larger share of the productivity shortfall in the UK, while this is not the case in the average of the OECD countries. So of course, um, a large part of this uh, reflects the high weight of the service sector in the UK, but this is not the only story because on average, productivity in the service sector has been growing at a slower pace than in manufacturing. So looking forward, this issue of productivity is going to become even more important because leaving the single market is going to hit productivity further. And the impact is going to be different across sectors, depending on what will be uh, the expected increase in trade barriers and the degree of openness of the sectors. So what we did in this chart is um, to try to compute to what extent productivity in the service sector is going to be depressed if you move from the current low level of trade barriers that you can observe at the moment within the single market to the higher level of trade barriers that firms from non-EU market which do not have access to the single market phase. And so if you increase trade barriers like this, you can see that this depressed productivity in the service sectors by between two to 5%. And you can also identify the sectors that are going to be the most affected, which are transport and storage and professional services. So the difficulty here is that we cannot really single out one candidate to explain the poor productivity performance in the UK. Uh, this is what uh, people have done the productivity puzzle. So what we do in the survey is to formulate a range of policies, recommendations to foster productivity in the service sector. So I'm not going to have the time to um, detail all the recommendation, but I'm going to focus on two main key areas that we um, uh, look in detail in the, in the survey. The first one is skill, and Tim already touched a little bit upon that. And the second one is investment. So starting with skill, uh, we do think that the UK government should really focus on skill policies at the moment. Uh, training and retraining was already important prior to the crisis. But with the COVID crisis, we know that some workers are going to uh, change positions and to have to 
to move to new activities and new sectors. So they are going to require um, to, uh, to, to, they are going to have to, to uh, acquire new competencies. And as Tim has shown, uh, there is also evidence in the UK that basic skills are lacking. And this is the type of skills that you do need to uh, acquire more sophisticated digital skills. And we also have evidence that um, spending on adult learning has been declining as, as um, of infirm training. Uh, we, we do report some analysis in the survey showing that infirm training has also been on a downward trend since uh, the financial crisis. So, um, and, and this is important because, uh, 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 <clears throat> sorry, and this really uh, underscores the need for, for, the, for the UK government to uh, uh, in, to uh, really focus on uh, uh, import, uh, in um, uh, adding more resources dedicated to training. So the government has introduced some measures in the context of the plans for jobs, but we do think it needs to do uh, even more uh, funding to training, and in particular to um, um, uh, take a particular attention to two categories of workers. The first one is the low-skilled workers, and the second one are the self-employed. And you can see in this chart that those two categories of workers receive less training than other workers, especially in the UK. And this is important because the low-skilled workers constitute a um, um, higher share of the workforce in the UK than in most OECD countries. And we have some evidence uh, also from OECD works that providing good quality training to these categories of workers can be a double dividend policy. It can foster productivity, but it can also lower inequality by bridging the digital divide. The second category of workers that is also important to uh, look at are the self-employed, simply because the number of sample plants is going to increase over time with the change in the nature of work and the rise of digital platforms. So it's also really key that those type of workers um, have access to affordable and good quality training. So let me now move to um, the second element um, that we focus on to boost productivity uh, in, in the survey, which is investment. Investment is really key uh, to foster the productivity in, uh, in the short term. Increasing public investment is probably one of the fiscal instruments that has a higher impact on growth in the short term. But it's also important for the medium to long term because we know that investment is a key element of productivity. So in this chart, you can see um, that uh, investment, both private and public, has been low in the UK compared to France, Germany, and uh, the United States. Um, this has happened for some time now. And at least in terms of private investment, the situation has even deteriorated since the Brexit referendum. Uh, and we do have some evidence that Brexit-related uncertainties have, have been holding back a decision on uh, investment in the private sector. So the government is aware of the situation and in March, it has introduced um, a, a big package of increase in public investment by 640,000 um, billion of, of pounds by 2024. So this is really significant. It means that by 2024, um, the UK uh, could um, exceed the public investment rates observed in France, Germany, and the United States last year. So we really welcome um, this announcement. But one point that we make forcefully in the report is that there is also a need to ensure continuity of support, and in particular to keep uh, the long-term focus on investment planning that was introduced in the industrial strategy and that was missing from past uh, UK policies. So the next question is, how do you allocate this investment? Um, the uh, government has announced that 
Some of it is going to be directed uh, to our key infrastructure areas, uh, but most of it has not been allocated yet. And we don't even know the timing of some of it. This is going to be announced in the forthcoming spending review. But there is one area where the UK is really lagging compared to best performers. It's in terms of adoption of complex technologies. And um, the COVID crisis has really under, underscored the necessity of having this type of technologies to facilitate exchange of information between platforms and to foster economic resilience. So you can see in the chart here that um, the share of digital infrastructure in the stream of investment that is currently in the pipeline is uh, really uh, small. The government has announced 0.2% of GDP um, dedicated to uh, digital infrastructure by 2025 which is going to be directed to the most deprived areas. Uh, we think it's a good um, uh, measure, but our recommendation here is really to prioritize a digital infrastructure in the allocation of a uh, plan increase in investment uh, that has been announced. Uh, we think it's going to uh, really foster good, strong productivity gains but also if it's directed to the most deprived areas and if good governance are in place, it could also help the government achieve its leveling up agenda and, and reduce some of the regional disparities. Let me now move to um, the next, um, the last thing that we cover on the survey, which is how to manage a soft exit from uh, the EU single market. Um, so I'm not going to have the time to cover all the materials that we have in the survey at the moment, uh, but I'm going to focus on two main issues there. The first one is going to be on the risk of an ODIN and how to mitigate uh, its uh, economic damages. And the second issue will be on what are the trade implications of entering into a free trade agreement with the European Union. So we all know that we are uh, in an uncertain situation now and that um, the risk of a no deal cannot be ruled out. Uh, so at the OECD, we have published um, estimates of a no deal on several occasions. And what we report in this chart are um, our latest estimates. Um, on the, and this is a trade impact more precisely the impact on export that um, you can see at, at the sectoral level and that was computed uh, using our um, OECD uh, metro model. So you can see that the impact on export of an ODIL is huge. But it, what is perhaps even more interesting is to be able to identify the sectors that are going to be the most affected, which are here the motor vehicle and transport sector, the meat industry, the textiles industry. So in the survey, we mentioned that uh, the degree of preparedness to a no deal exit um, has progressed, not least because a year ago, we were in a very similar situation. So the government and firms have learned from uh, this past experience. But of course, compared to a year ago, the COVID crisis has happened and it has deteriorated the balance sheets of firm and their ability to, to direct resources to a uh, to new system or to training. So overall, it, it is not clear cut at all whether we are in a better or in a worse situation than a year ago. So what we do in the survey is to formulate a few recommendations to uh, mitigate the economic impact of a no deal uh, in the event that uh, this happens. Let me um, mention two key ones here. The first one is, would be to, uh, to provide targeted support to firms and workers that we know are going to be the most affected. And the government should really anticipate this support and in particular focus on small firms, which we know have less resources and less access to information, but also on firms and workers that have been rendered fragile by the COVID crisis. 
A second strand of policy that is really important in the case of a no deal would be to introduce some trade facilitation policies to smooth disruption at the border. Let me now move on to the second issue I wanted to address uh, in this section, which is um, on um, the work we've done to uh, um, investigate the trade impact of entering uh, into a free trade agreement with the European Union. So what we did here and what is reported in this slide um, are the quantification we did again with uh, the OECD made for model of entering a, a zero tariff, zero quota free trade agreement with the European Union. So what we found was that uh, this would lead to um, a, a decline in UK imports by about 8% in the medium term, and um, UK uh, a decline by 6% uh, of UK exports. So let me stress that this is much less than what would happen in the case of an OG, even if it still entails some cost. Overall, the output loss uh, associated with this entry into a free trade agreement, and this is the first bar that you have here, uh, would uh, be around 3.5% in the medium term. What is also interesting is to try to break down um, and to try to find the source of this output loss, which is represented here in the right-hand panel that you have in this chart. And in particular, you can see that about two-thirds of this output loss would come from a rise in trade barriers that have applied to um, trading goods, and a remaining one third would come from more stringent regulations applied to the service sector. Another observation that we make in the survey is that if you, uh, if if if, um, if migration from EU national slows, then this is going to accentuate the um, output loss of leaving, leaving the EU single market. And this is a second bar that you can, second blue bar that you can see in the chart here. Uh, what we did was to quantify the impact of um, ending free movement of EU nationals and the additional regulatory costs this is going to bring to the service sector. And according to our estimate, this will add an additional 0.7 percentage point to the 3.5% of GDP that I mentioned before. And bear in mind that this is a, a lower bound estimate because we do not account here for the impact of migration on labor supply. But by contrast, uh, the UK government could also implement some structural reforms that would mitigate um, this output loss. Um, this is, um, uh, we agree with uh, this statement, but we also think that the scope of this type of reform is limited not least because um, the, um, the regulatory framework of the UK is uh, already um, in a very um, way designed compared to, uh, to, um, to, other, to what we can observe in, in other OECD countries. But what we did here was to try to identify a few reforms that could be undertaken. For instance, um, lowering the price um, of the time deliverance of visa, or acting on government procurements and try to quantify the effect of these reforms and to see to what extent it would mitigate the output loss. And you can see here on the third blue bar that indeed it does mitigate some of the output loss, but not entirely. At the end, we end up with an output loss, which is about close to 3%. The last point I would like to make here is that leaving the EU single market is going to have a, a different impact across UK across the UK regions, which in fact is uh, simply the mirror image of what's happening at the sectoral level. And to illustrate this fact, what uh, we've represented here are the sectoral specialization of the different regions. And you can see, for instance, that the north of um, uh, of England and Wales are more specialized in manufacturing. And so they are going to be uh, affected 
by what's going to happen in this sector. By contrast, London and the Southeast are more specialized in services and in particular on financial services. So there, the extent of the disruption is going to come essentially by the type of agreement uh, that is going to replace passport rights. So this type of analysis, uh, together with the more qualitative analysis that we have in the survey, really underscore the need for um, the UK to keep low barriers to trade and investment vis-a-vis -vis EU countries, but also vis-a-vis -vis non-EU countries. And one key recommendation we have in the survey is also for the government to seek high market access for the service sector, and in particular, financial markets. Thank you very much. Um, I think I need to give the floor to Rajit now. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you all. That was uh, comp both comprehensive, um, fascinating, and, and incredibly important, given the conjuncture of shocks the UK is facing, but also the current structure of the economy. I'd like to return, um, or turn rather, to uh, Dr. Hande Kachuk, who will give a first response on uh, to some of the issues. And, and I think we're going to find a lot of agreement, but it's nice to give the floor to Hande and see um, how she'd like to respond to those things. Um, please continue to send your questions in. I'm making a note of them all, and I will turn to them at the end of the presentation. So, so don't do bear in mind that uh, we have a, quite a long question section afterwards. So um, Hande, if I may turn to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jagjit. And thanks for our OECD colleagues for this very comprehensive presentation and this very comprehensive report that we'll definitely analyze more uh, deeply in the coming days. Um, so as Jagjit said, uh, we are uh, in, in most of the areas that you have touched, we are on similar, uh, we are on the, on the same page more or less. So uh, especially on the social and economic effects of COVID-19, which the Institute also analyzed uh, you know, quite extensively uh, since the outbreak uh, on you know, the focus on sectoral heterogeneity in responses to COVID-19, on the you know, uh, difficulties regarding recovery and the long-term effects of the pandemic, as well as uh, Brexit risks, the critical role of policy in mitigating these risks and uh, in all dimensions, not just macroeconomic policy, but the need to support uh, macroeconomic policies with um, labor market policies uh, alongside structural reforms. We are all on the same page in these uh, in, in these emphasis, emphasis of the OECD report. And also uh, the long lasting low productivity question is uh, another issue that is on uh, top of our agenda, which Jagjit will uh, mention more after I uh, talk about this. So most of these work uh, have been done before I joined the Institute. So I'm ha very happy to uh, share uh, some of the Institute's previous work on this. So I hope I'll uh, do a you know, fair job of doing that. So uh, since uh, our first quarterly report where we had to uh, work around the COVID shock, we emphasized these five main channels of COVID-19 impact. So the supply side effects coming from uh, lower hours of work and lower productivity, um, both supply and demand effects due to lockdowns, you know, lower consumption and investment prospects and uh, you know, external demand uh, dragging demand and supply um, in the economy, lower risk appetite and higher cost of capital. So all these five channels have been very important in generating the unprecedented fall in Q2. And as the lockdowns eased uh, and some of the supply and demand considerations uh, eased alongside this, we observed a subsequent recovery in Q3, but uh, we still see that most of these effects are in place, especially on the back of higher infection rates, you know, lower demand and persistent unemployment prospects. So these are the main constraints for recovery going forward. But uh, needless to say, policy support, especially timely monetary and fiscal policy, and the scale and the timeliness of these have been instrumental in uh, generating the recovery in Q3, but there's a long and rocky road ahead for recovery, which needs very careful, comprehensive uh, policy response. So in terms of understanding COVID-19 uh, impacts, 
the sector sectoral analysis have been important. So, so one of the things we uh, stressed in previous uh, analysis is the sectoral interactions uh, through input output relationships through demand and supply upstream downstream relationships between sectors. So uh, even for sectors which are not directly exposed to COVID-19 restrictions, such as private traded sector, finance, utilities, we've seen very large spillovers of, of lockdowns. So um, in ESER's estimates were, um, you know, if we attributed the, you know, 25%, if lo looking at the 25% fall between April and February at the height of the lockdown, while we attribute 15% of these to the lockdowns, the remaining uh, are attributed to spillovers. And uh, the differential sectoral impacts continue. So this shows the cumulative percentage change in monthly GDP. And while in total, we are about 9% below pre-COVID levels in some sectors like arts, other services, business support services, uh, we are at very, uh, you know, almost 20-25% uh, down in these sectors. And this also shows the extent of the sectoral reallocation that uh, might have to happen in the coming months on the uh, back of heightened COVID risks. So the particular challenge as uh, stressed by the OECD report as well is how do we recover from such a shock which has such differential sectoral impacts and you know, such uh, long-term uh, scarring prospects in a post-Brexit economy because uh, different uh, channels are operating uh, due to Brexit. And as we are coming to the end of the transition period, as the uncertainty uh, regarding the uh, FTA and the uh, you know, uh, European uh, Union uh, trade relationship persists, uh, we, we are still faced with chronic uncertainty holding back recovery of in investment and productivity. So these will, even if we recover from the uh, pandemic, these will continue to um, put a downside uh, risk on investment and productivity growth. So long run uh, pros uh, productivity weakness uh, is seems to stay in the long run, uh, both due to COVID and Brexit. And, uh, you know, of course, export performance would depend heavily on the type of FTA and how it would be implemented in different areas of the economy. So these are some of the uh, estimates we worked uh, before using our global econometric model, NIGEM, uh, taking into account all uh, trade relationships of the UK. So we initially uh, you know, focused more on uh, three scenarios, soft Brexit, customs union, and orderly no deal. And now a fourth scenario, we are uh, approaching a fourth scenario, which, which falls between the customs union and orderly no deal. So we expect effects, overall effects, to be around uh, minus 5% in the long run, but two to 3% of these effects have already happened through the channels I described before, especially uh, through you know, lower investment and productivity growth dragging, dragging down trend output uh, before the end of the transition period. So in light of both the pandemic related challenges and the Brexit challenges, which are, uh, which will be more, uh, which will be effective both in the short run and long run, we expect a very uh, slow recovery to pre-COVID path. So uh, lower potential output due to weaker capital accumulation and stagnant productivity, risk of permanent scarring increasing, particularly through unemployment and poverty, and um, we are to update our forecast at the end of this month, but previous forecasts didn't um, envisage um, GDP re reaching its uh, pre-COVID levels until uh, the end of uh, 2023. So when thinking about um, COVID and post, you know, uh, and um, exit from EU single market, we started to uh, recently think more about interactions between the two shocks. So uh, what are the uh, shocks that amplify each other and are some of the shocks mitigated because they coincide or intersect? So um, one difficulty is that the internal and external adjustment in the economy will have to happen at the same time. Internal adjustment to new sectoral allocations due to COVID and external adjustment to new trading partners, new trade barriers, they will have to happen at the same time. 
so interactions between the two shocks, particularly at sectoral level, will be critical. Uh, for example, sectors that are less exposed to COVID-related risks, like private traded sector or finance, are likely to feel the brunt of Brexit more, either under FDA or, uh, you know, a no, no deal uh, WTO agreement. But for sectors that are already hit by, very hard by COVID, like arts, recreation, tourism, the additional short-run impact from Brexit is likely to be more limited compared to the fall, you know, compared to the damage that we already see, except uh, for a few sectors like retail, which has a large share in employment. So uh, given these challenges, um, we agree, we couldn't agree, we cannot agree more with the OECD survey that uh, a comprehensive plan for government policy will be critical to achieve these mm -hmm. multiple macro objectives, especially, I mean, as I focus on these more here. So fiscal monetary support until the uh, recovery is sustained, as well as active labor uh, support policies and structural reforms uh, to address the internal and external adjustment uh, requirements of the UK economy uh, going forward. So to leave more time for discussion, uh, I, I can uh, stop, stop now and leave the floor to Jagjit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Handa. Excellent um, to hear that um, exposed. As Handa says, we have our own uh, review coming out surely. Um, if we can just wait a second, I shall put my slides up and I'll try to only take five minutes of your time um, really to go through some points that um, pretty much self-evident, hopefully. Um, Handa, can, can I just check my screen is sharing? I'm, not, I'm getting a strange message through my system. It is. Thank you very much. So. Um, I want to just address very briefly the relationship between the supply side of the economy productivity as Annabelle was talking about in macroeconomic policy. I'm sorry for all the banners at the bottom. I feel a little bit like a premiership footballer. This is the a number of people who have to sponsor us to do things, but I'm delighted to have the support of the SRC, uh, the Centre for Macro uh, Centre at the LSE with its uh, uh, various polls of which the Institute is one the Nuffield Foundation and the ESRC's new Productivity Institute, which is set up in Manchester. So I wanted to get that across to people on this call. It's the ESRC's single largest investment and the managing director of that is Bart Van Ark, who's joined us in the UK from the conference board. So we will certainly as an institute, as an institute the National Institute, facilitate stronger links between the work the OECD is doing and the product, newly found Productivity Institute um, based at Manchester. Um, what, um, hopefully this will, move on, it will, good. Um, the long run productivity problem in the UK um, is can be masked by very large scale short term volatility. The business cycle in the UK, whether it's the investment accelerated business cycle or the demand led stop go cycle can sometimes mask what has been a secular slowdown in productivity performance in the UK. There's all kinds of charts to demonstrate this, whether I do it internationally compared to our made trading partners or in the long run, as I've done here, the story is remarkably the same. There is also a story of scarring from the financial crisis and most probably scarring from COVID-19. But I do want to make the clear point contextually that if you look at the UK productivity performance, it has deteriorated, uh, I should say, beyond the length of my lifetime. I don't go all the way back to 1948, but I go a large part of that back in time. Um, and it's something that I think we need to think very carefully about in terms of what institutions we need and how we need to change the macroeconomic levers. The OECD report is quite excellent as ever on both the conjuncture analysis of the macroeconomic policies undertaken and asking for better plans in the future. But I think what I want to point to and the, what I want to reiterate is a point that we've been making since the start of this crisis and since my start as director of the Institute. And that's for better institutional institutions to manage the uncertainty and risk that any economy faces. Believe quite strongly that it's the role of public policy not to duck the problem of uncertainty, but to try and resolve it with institutional reform and prompt policies to deal with those uncertainties. I could name a number of examples this year where policy, okay, at some level has acted promptly. The initial responses in monetary policy and fiscal policy were largely appropriate, but the subsequent drift and uncertainty 
in terms of dealing with what other levers we might have in terms of monetary policy and the extent to which the furlough was going to be extended or not, and indeed whether or not we're going to have a budget are fundamentally damaging to the long-term plans that household and firms have to make. And this is something I've seen time and time again in the UK. It's not a point that is solely related to one political party or not. It is a fundamental problem of institutional capability in the UK. Let me not understate the difficult times which we're all living in. Households, people, those at work, those not at work, those with families are all um, suffering in various degrees from this quite awful moment in, in world history. And I think that puts even more pressure on public policy to think hard about its coordination, the extent to which fiscal and monetary policy might dominate, but fundamentally, and it's a point that I think Sebastian raised very wisely right at the beginning, what do we think our targets are of monetary and fiscal policy? Where do we want to go and over how long do we want to go them, uh, go move towards them? And what form of instruments do we need to meet those targets? We've had in the UK a sequence of arbitrary fiscal rules. I've lost count. It might be 10, it might be 12 in the last 10 years. And so they've served a form of purpose, but they haven't actually addressed the social welfare criterion. And that is one of creating a, a background that leads to prosperity for most people. It just hasn't happened. And our institutional frameworks, as the presentations we've just heard, do not, it seems to me, to be confronting well the uncertainties that are brought forward by Brexit and COVID. The economic analysis is as one. We can spot the weaknesses. We know the sectors and the regions that will be affected by Brexit and those that are uh, being those issues that are being revealed as weaknesses from COVID. And it's therefore critical that government address these and doesn't du don't duck them. And I'm afraid it's something that we're seeing time and time again, a ducking of the issues. Monetary policy itself has acted promptly as, as Jon outlined and, and very wisely the monetary and financial system has responded well to this if only because of the capital and liquidity buffers that were introduced at the time of the last crisis but the monetary policy support that's providing fiscal space must not ultimately undermine long-run price and financial stability and if we don't underpin operational independence and maintain the frameworks that guarantee financial markets smooth functioning we will find there to be even worse problems on exit from this crisis. What do we want from fiscal policy? Here's some principles we set out in the spring that by and large, I don't think have been fully followed through. Fiscal policy must decide on the quantum of risk to absorb. Don't forget the lockdown in the economy is itself a government policy designed to limit the spread of the virus. Therefore, by and large, the people who are suffering from the lockdown have, are not in directly any way particularly responsible for the losses they're bearing. It's therefore incumbent upon fiscal policy to provide sufficient resources to help these people through this crisis in a timely, targeted and state contingent manner. We don't know when this terrible virus uh, will be solved as a problem. We therefore need to provide people with sufficient comfort over this period for as long as this virus is a, a significant impact on their behavior that fiscal policy will offset it. I'll lead you to go through the points in your own time. They're ones that I've made before. I don't need to read them out to people. I'll assume you've gone through the points as I'm talking. But clearly, I, I'm asking for um, a, a better fiscal response than we've seen so far. There's a monetary menu, which goes from conventional space all the way up to unconventional space if we need it. Some of the words that we've used in the spring are now doing the circuit in the popular press, such as do no harm. And that's really what monetary policies is all about. We can think about more government debt. We can even think about negative policy rates. But I think before we get there, we can still think about better communication from our policy committee in terms of what they think they're trying to do over the medium term, as well as publishing forecasts of not only interest rates, but also the stock of debt that will be held over the medium term. And we can do all of that well before we go into conventional space. None of these things have been properly spent, spelt out other than in a book the Institute published last autumn, uh, which was a number of papers put together by monetary experts and market participants on the menu of options facing the Bank of England. What's the overall framework for debt that we need? Well, we know public debt shares risk with future generations as future generations will benefit if we can keep the show on the road. Um, 
yes, we need to control debt because it promotes efficiency in the provision of debt, but also maintains our capacity to respond to future shocks. We don't know exactly what's going to happen over the next 20 years. So we're going to have to think of a world in which we can deploy public debt. But there should be no talk right now of of increasing taxes. We can go through quite a lot of tax smoothing with interest rates at zero. It's not something we have to worry about. The history of fiscal control in the UK gives considerable credibility uh, to the institutions that we have and we might develop in order to deal with these expenditure shocks without having to immediately jump to tax increases, even though that will be required, particularly in a world in which we think the public sector will be more important than it was in the past. We've only got to think about health, education, digital questions raised by our colleagues at the OECD and the need for infrastructure. We haven't got a good social objective function for fiscal policy and for some time we've argued for some fundamental reform of instrument setting in the UK, a timetable of revenues, expenditure plans and certainly not a world in which the Chancellor can cancel the budget at short notice. I should be absolutely clear all these views are those of the National Institute and not necessarily shared by our colleagues at the OECD. And so it does, it does behove me to remind myself of a book written by James Dow, former deputy director of the Institute. Handa, you have much to live up to. Um, James Dow's his book on the management of the British economy, talking about stop go in the time at the time. And he's, what he's arguing is that the major fluctuations in the rate of growth of demand and output in the years after 1952 were thus chiefly due to government policy. It's government policy itself that he's pointing to as the thing that's artificially stoking the business cycle and preventing long run planning from occurring. And I think it's something to which I'm increasingly being persuaded as. The poor extent and quality of our short run demand management is itself largely or at least significantly responsible for our ongoing supply side failures in the UK. Thank you. Um, I will stop there. I think I've managed to do that in the time available so i'm going to stop sharing and we have a number of questions thank you chris for coming back to tell me where you are um i'm going to i'm going to start with three questions that i have i'll put them to the panel um perhaps we could all turn our, on our mics and give reasonably brief answers i think we'll be we'll be okay i can see some questions coming in the first one is from uh philip davis who's a professor of economics at uh, the university of brunel and also a long time a long-standing fellow uh, of the National Institute. And Philip is asking a question about migration policy uh, in the coming years. And I think that's probably one for Tim, but if I've got that wrong, please please allow me to apologize. I then like to repeat the question from Bernard Casey, who's um, ex-OECD official, so I assume some of you know him, um, and is, is interested, I guess, is another question for Tim really, and not only in terms of childcare support, but also elder care support. Would that also be helpful as well if we can think about supporting uh, those who are um, those in the aging part of the population? Mm. Um, and then finally, in this round, we have a question from uh, the university, uh, a colleague of ours at the University of Glasgow, um, Geeta Selvaratnam, um, who is asking. I'm just give me a second to re find that question. Um, can we do anything to help training by the individual rather than necessary through the organization? So I, I think they're nearly all for you, Tim, but do you want to take what you can? And then I'm very happy to pass to others for further comment. Would that be okay, Tim? Actually, maybe I'll jump in on yes, the migration do. question. And first, yeah. actually, may, may, many thanks to you and to Handa for really interesting presentations. Uh, again, the sort of personal comment, but one thing I've learned from living outside the UK for a long time is the truth of your comment about sort of short termism in the UK. Uh, yeah. In the survey, we talk about the importance of medium term fiscal frameworks being more effective. Yeah. I think the other area where that's very, very clear is in terms of the industrial strategy. Most yes. countries, as I go around the OECD, have very well developed old institutions that basically promote economic development at the local level and put people together and channel yeah. money. Uh, our surveys often write about ways of improving those. But in the UK, we just don't have a consistent layer that does that. Yeah. Um, and I think the industrial strategy we see, you, know, you can argue about bits of it, but if it, if it lays that foundation, it will be yeah. very good, but that needs continuity. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Sebastian. Just to say, I'm very grateful you said that. I, I, I was very clear not to put my words in your mouth, as it were, but I'm very glad that we are, in a sense, speaking with the same voice, or certainly from the same hymn sheet. 
Perfect. Okay, let me just turn very briefly uh, to the migration question, which I think is a very good one. It's not one that the survey deals with um, uh, directly. Uh, in the uh, short run, obviously, the, the unemployment in, is going to be very high. The, uncert the slack in the labor market is high. Um, people's, willing that, people's ability to move between countries is going to be limited, and perhaps their willingness to do it is going to be reduced. So I think there's a number of short-term issues that we don't really take a view on, but I think are, are good questions uh, and open questions. I think in the longer term, as Annabelle showed in her presentation, um, the ending of free movement uh, you know, will have a big impact on the UK economy, uh, both the, the movement of skilled and unskilled workers. We know there are big parts of the, the labour market that have been uh, very dependent uh, on migrant labour. Uh, so, so we have had concerns about that. I think they've eased somewhat mm -hmm. as the government uh, has revised its policy framework, but I think that still is a question. Uh, and I think the other thing to say in the migration area is that um, uh, it's really about the impact of migration and also put the position of the native workers uh, within the system. But I think that's why, again, Annabelle put so much emphasis on training, particularly of, of, of lower skilled workers. Uh, and also, as I think Tim mentioned, I think having good um, uh, in-work supports is also very helpful. So I think, you know, that's not quite an answer to the question on migration, but I think it shows that there are big issues uh, in these in these areas, and this is kind of the way the OECD would respond to them. Um, just briefly before I turn to Tim on the elderly care question, again, as I go around the OECD, this is a massive question in all countries, both how to provide the care and how to finance it. Um, at least in the countries I visited, I've not seen a, an amazing, really brilliant response anywhere that I would say this is what the UK should do. But I think it is, you know, again, coming back actually to the point you were making about long-term institutions, uh, someone needs to think really deeply about how we're going to address this problem and how we're going to pay for it. Um, you know, it can't be solved through short-term initiatives. There's, there's no easy quick win on this. Tim, maybe you want to expand. But just Maybe just to pick up directly on that, there are some countries uh, or some regions which are doing some interesting things which are innovative and could be good examples in this area of elderly care. Um, and what they tend to be doing is to move away from institutionalised care to rely more on home-based care. So setting up systems where there are networks of nurses or people who can come and help people in their houses so they don't need to move into aged care facilities. Um, this tends to be lower cost than um, institutionalized or moving people into aged care facilities and everyone seems to prefer that. Uh, so from memory there are examples from some areas in Switzerland and some areas in Holland in the Netherlands where, where this is underway and this is a model that other countries could draw on. Uh, to, to, to deal like the, the question is a really good question and it's just going to become more important over time given demographics across OECD countries. Uh, the question on training particularly for self uh, for self-employed owned account workers Annabelle can come up pick this up too as well um, but the model here would be so you're right so what's one of the issues for these types of workers is that there isn't an employer who can um, potentially provide access to training at lower cost and so that means that there needs to be greater reliance on um, some sort of training account, some sort of which governments can support for various funding mechanisms, uh, and then access to training providers where there's clarity about what workers will, what the self-employed will get from this training in terms of the quality of the training, the relevance to, to whatever they need in the workplace. Uh, and uh, that way uh, people can make informed decisions about what training they engage in. So the sort of mix of um, owner of uh, training accounts, some sort of government support um, that encourages people to invest in this because there is a public good aspect to this. And then a training market where there's the clear information about quality and the substance of the training. But maybe Annabelle has some points to add. Thank you, Tim. Uh, actually, I don't have any point to add on, on the training, but if I may add uh, one point, small point on the migration question. Um, we also look a little bit on the survey um, and um, we, we are discussing a little bit the different impact uh, of a change in migration in terms of how much um, how the different regions and the different sectors are going to be affected. And mm -hmm. through that ending free, uh, free movement of EU nationals is going to have a particular impact on the hospitality and the personal care sectors, which we know are under stress at the moment. Uh, so there, what uh, we, we recommend is to um, 
to um, reinstall the, the existing short-term uh, schemes that already exist and that could, could help uh, avoid having uh, a, a lot of labor shortages there. And looking more over the medium to long term, uh, one point that we make in the survey is um, to really try to have a flexible system. And we take the example of Canada and Australia there, which um, in terms of immigration system have proven to be very flexible. And this is key so that you can adapt to the change in the situation. And we know we are living in very uncertain times and that we need to be agile and to be, uh, to be able to, to really uh, adapt our system to uh, as much as possible. But on training, no, I don't have anything else to, to add to. Well, thank you much, Annabelle. I, I mean, I, I, we, can only, we can't do full justice to the quality of the report in time that's available. So I'd encourage everyone to download it and read it. And um, I wonder if I could move on to the next set of questions uh, just now. Um, we have, uh, I've tried to get Nazira Bradley on the line. Have we managed to do that? Well, we're trying to see if we can do that. We have a question from uh, Chris Lewin at the uh, Institute of Actuaries, who's asking about relative investment, which was something that Annabel talked about. So we plot these relative investment charts. Do we have an idea why? Is it just the public sector or is there also a problem with the financial sector? Let me sort of re reorient the question, if I might. That might be one best put to you. Annabelle, if I might, but we also have a question from David uh, Debenham, who's a researcher at the household level. Do we have any views, and this might be one for Hande, uh, uh, um, possibly Tim as well, just the extent to which this shock that we're currently living through is, is impacting on inequality at the household level, um, and, and is sufficient action being undertaken by the government to offset that? It seems to me that we might well be uh, facing some problems there. Perhaps if you could just Remember, that, hold those two questions in your mind. We've got Nazira on the line to ask her question as well. So let's try and do that um, if we can, just to provide a bit of variety. Uh, Nazira, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation from all of you. My question is really directed to Annabelle, though there are lots of questions, but this one specifically. Annabelle, in your, uh, the survey that you all conducted with regards to the productivity analysis and especially the sectoral composition which contributed to the share in productivity loss, did you all cover the firm size composition? The reason I ask this, UK has a much lower large firm share or as a share of GDP and this has been deteriorating since the 70s which coincides with a reduction in productivity levels. And from an innovation perspective, this is possibly related to lower best bills, uh, best practices, lower spillovers, but also just genuinely their value added and the number of people that you employ as large firm shares is much higher than smaller SMEs. And the other question is that, um, Ha, was there any relation to you say that UK has a much lower, low, uh, much higher low skill level of workers? Is this in any way related to the fact that we have generated far more micro firms over the last few years? And is there any association of the skill level with the firm size share? Thank you very much, Nazira. I, I was very impressed by the question. I should also say that you're from the Innovation and Growth Think Tank. So we'll certainly spend a bit of time looking at your work more carefully after this. Thank you for an excellent question. Um, so, so between, uh, I would go in any order, perhaps Annabelle first and then Tim and Handa could construct replies to any parts of those questions that they wish. Would that be okay? Annabelle. Yes, yes thank you. Thanks a lot for this question. Um, so regarding the, taking the question in reverse order, regarding the firm um, level analysis, uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> we try to, uh, to account for um, the uh, size of firms to the extent possible. Uh, and we did have some firm uh, level analysis in terms of looking at which are the laggard and the leader firms. But uh, we could not really uh, look at the, the productivity of small firms simply because uh, the coverage of the database that we are using um, starts at um, firms with, um, with more than 20 employees. So it's just in terms of data availability that we were limited. But um, we did look at the firm uh, size uh, when we uh, approached some different topics. 
I just give you uh, two examples there where we, uh, we, we have a section looking at uh, the support to small firms and how it's, uh, it's in our view necessary to, to review this support and to consolidate all the different types of support that exist. Um, and uh, another example is that when we talk about R&D, we also uh, look at uh, what uh, small firms receive in terms of R&D support. And in particular, we found that in the UK, uh, they do not receive a lot of uh, R&D uh, support compared to large firms. So, to the, so the answer is that to the extent possible, we, we try, but we could not uh, do a systematic analysis uh, looking um, at the term side. Um, in terms of the question on investment, um, this is a difficult question. It's like the productivity puzzle. You cannot find all the solution. Uh, but um, our take on that is, I think there are some part of structural issues that are extending the low investment rate in the UK, uh, which, um, which are actually related to, to the same issue that are screening the, the low productivity performance as well. Uh, and but more recently, it's clear that you also had a, a kind of Brexit related effect and the impact on uh, uncertainties that has been, uh, has been uh, clearly documented uh, um, in, in our work, but also elsewhere. Uh, and this, uh, this one has clearly had an impact on the private investment side. So on the public investment side, um, I, I think in the past there has been some cut down in, uh, as a when there was the austerity period, but since then, as I said, the government has announced this package, so we do have to, that's going to be a catch up in that stuff. Uh, I'll let you, team, talk about the poverty, or you want me to? Okay, you go. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to talk about inequality, inequality. Um, so basically, um, the question the question was the impact of COVID on inequality. Yeah, I think this is a very fair question. At the moment, we only have partial evidence on that. So it's true that in, term, in terms of, uh, we do see that some categories of people have been more affected than others. And I'm thinking about women, I'm thinking about young people, I'm thinking about uh, people who are low skilled. Clearly, um, this seems to, uh, to to, to have been more, been more affected by the COVID crisis than other type of workers. But if you take the term inequality in a broader sense and in terms of regional um, uh, disparities there, there we do have a, a, some tentative analysis in the, in the survey, but we really do think it's too early to draw some conclusions at the moment. We really have mixed evidence on that at the moment. So it's very hard to say in which direction things are going. Maybe, maybe if I may add on the inequality. Yes, please, uh, please. So our uh, colleagues at NIST have done a very nice study relation model called LINDA. And it was in the late last uh, review. And it was saying that um, COVID was causing increase in poverty, destitution, uh, especially, uh, I mean, the estimates were that destitution is projected to be about uh, three times higher than the non-COVID counterfactual level in, uh, by the second quarter of 2020. So this is attributed to various re reasons, one of them being the effect on the self-employed and the effect on the unemployed, especially in sectors uh, with, you know, which require low skilled workers in, uh, which are also more affected by COVID. So as the furlough scheme uh, winds down and uh, the recovery isn't still sustained, these people who lose their jobs might spend a lot of time out of the labor market while they are placed in other jobs. So at this point, it is really critical that uh, government's uh, fiscal policies and labor market policies make sure that people are attached to the labor market while uh, or during and so this will be this will have a crucial impact on on inequality thank you Handa. um we're going to 
turn to Furlough in a minute, but we also had one question possibly for Annabel and Hande from Ajit Mehta at uh, Oak North Bank and just really asking whether um, there are any uh, countries that that we in our simulations that benefit from Brexit. Can I just check, Annabel, that the simulations of the responses were all long runs, they're all steady state analyses, or were they over a particular time horizon? Perhaps that's a one clarification question from me. But in terms of, uh, are we able to identify any countries that, that actually benefit from uh, either an FTA or a, or a no-deal Brexit? Okay, so further clarification, these are medium-term effects, so five to ten months. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And uh, in terms of the impact on EU countries, actually what we report uh, in the surveys part of a, a paper that we'll, uh, we will be publishing in about three weeks, where we, we have the impact uh, on the UK, but also on EU countries. And the yeah. answer is clearly no, nobody wins. Uh, the, the only thing is that the impact on the UK is much larger than the impact on uh, EU countries. Um, so, on average, on aggregate term, economy-wide, nobody wins. But it's true that for some sectors, some countries may gain. Um, so, a clear example is finance there, where uh, we know that some um, activities may be uh, uh, going to continent continental Europe. Uh, but, um, but otherwise, uh, the answer is no, nobody gains from Brexit. Thank you, Annabelle. That's a sobering thought. Hande, do you want to add to that? The answer can be no. <laughs> your your microphone is off, or, or perhaps my or perhaps my hearing is gone. Sorry. Um, I mean, not much to add. I mean, there and I mean, no one really uh, wins uh, yeah. from this, as far as our analysis are also concerned, and uh, our analysis are also long term estimates yeah. in all long term estimates. Like, so 10, 10 years effects. Thank you, Hande. Um, we, we've had a question come in really asking about uh, the nature of the first, what we might call furlough one, and now furlough two, um, and also the extent to which training should be accelerated. And Jon, I think, um, wants to come in on that. So may I just turn to Jon at this stage, who wants, would like to, well, has, has volunteered to make some comments on that question. Jon. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't sort of pick a winner between they both have strong systems um, uh, with different systems, but with strong sides. Uh, and coming from the OECD, I think we would never say anything else than that training is good in, in <laughs> context. But of course, uh, there may be a dead weight element, as, as was uh, said in the question. But I, I think in, in this situation, you have a dead weight, dead weight in, in many of the supports. And, and, and you can also, dead weight, you can also look at this as demand support. So, so I don't think there should be a sort of enormous worry about that uh, right now. Um, but if you look at what you try to achieve with a um, job retention scheme, it's, uh, it's really that you try to, to, to keep existing matches between um, jobs and people. And, and this, is, this is a very good instrument if you have a temporary disruption. Um, so, but as time goes, and we don't really know where, where this is going, uh, you need to start looking at structural change. You, you need these people, or some some jobs will not come back, and, and you will have to to see how how you can move people to new jobs. And of course, uh, unemployment is a step on the way uh, for many, and retraining is uh, also a, a sort of crucial support uh, that uh, that the government can give here. But it's a very difficult balance, and, uh, and now with uh, with the new. Uh, uh, the new uh, flare-up of the virus and the uh, new uh, three-tier system uh, of, uh, of restrictions around the country. Um, uh, it's, uh, the government is adapting, but it's really difficult to tell right now if they have found the right balance. But the training is definitely uh, should be an important part of any package. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I, I think it's um, I think we're still grappling with the adjustment. We don't quite know where the economy is going to go. So yes, there's going to be structural change, but, but the path, I suspect, as the phrase used by Hand earlier on, 
is going to be a rocky road. Um, it's not going to be something very smooth at all because we don't quite know what the destination is. I wish it were a mountain that we could see and move towards. It's just not as simple as that. I think it's covered by a lot of uh, bad weather, if I may continue the analogy. We're coming up to um, nearly half past. That gives, I think, a, a sort of 30 second uh, final word from everyone. And uh, I, I'm just going to, if I can, I'll just keep the same order, which would then be uh, Sebastian, uh, Jan, Tim, uh, and then Annabelle, and, and I'll give the final word to Handa. So uh, 30 seconds, uh, no repetition, uh, whatever, the, whatever the correct lines are, but uh, just off you go. Sebastian, final word really on the whole thing. Uh, so firstly, actually, let me say on behalf of all of us, uh, thanks very much for hosting a, a really interesting discussion. Thanks also for your excellent work, which we rely on and we look forward to, to working on things together. Uh, and I think thanks to everyone for, for an excellent set of questions. I think, as you said, the UK faces a very complicated set of, uh, set of challenges and the policy response is also quite complex. It has many aspects, but often it comes back to the fundamentals, which are things like productivity, uh, investment, uh, training. Uh, and sound institutions. Can't argue with that, Sebastian, at all. Um, Jon. Yes, I would also like to extend my, my thanks for, uh, for having me here. Um, I will uh, return to the furlough scheme. Uh, the one observation is how much we actually missed in our unemployment forecast the last time, in our previous forecast. And that's a testament to, to how efficient this scheme has been. Mm. And the question is, is it, is it for the future or, uh, or do you yeah. need to to something else? State contingent. Uh, Tim. Uh, so I'd add that uh, these sort of conversations are the essence of what good policy making and good policy is made of. Uh, it's, so this is a fantastic um, public cost contribution. Uh, I'll re-pick up the point on training uh, and then also to make the point that uh, this sort of crisis should be an opportunity to deal with deep-seated issues which have gone unaddressed for, for years. That's what should come out of, a, out of a crisis. And hopefully this will be an opportunity to address a lot of the skill gaps, particularly amongst more vulnerable households that exist in the UK. And that is the best way to deal with inequality and poverty in the long term, ensuring that everyone has access to the skills that will be needed for the future workforce. Thank you. I'm furiously agreeing. Annabelle. It's difficult to come after that. <laughs> uh, you, you, you can be, never get a word in after all <laughs> I'll be very pragmatic. Um, I thank you very much for this opportunity first. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great to be, uh, to be able to discuss uh, these issues with uh, all of you. Um, and uh, just wanted to say that there's still hope we, we, we have been very pessimistic in this uh, seminar, but there are still hope. And uh, the, the objective of this survey is really to be constructive and to go. You said you, we don't see the target, but yes, we know where the target is. It's a better world and uh, mm. where we are aiming for. And last thing is that um, I encourage you to, to read the survey as well. Um, and if you have any question, just come back to us. We will we'll have and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Annabelle. Hande. Thank you very much. It was a great event. We learned a lot from the survey and we, it was great to have an opportunity to share some of the work we did. And uh, I really appreciate the detailed analysis on um, exit from EU single market, your points around that, and also uh, your policy uh, recommendations regarding childcare and education reskilling. Uh, I think these were very important. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, our colleagues at the OECD, for an excellent uh, chance to interact. Um, as next stop, the Institute's review, 3rd of November. So uh, put that in your diary and we'll probably regroup. So thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, let's keep talking to our policymaking masters, see if they can do a better job. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.